industrial. So, hey, it's always good to be back here at industry. You guys, beautiful church. God's doing some cool stuff here. Amen? Amen. Well, it's good to see you all. Man, that rain is like coming down, isn't it? Or I guess it's not coming down. It's just like, you know, trickling. But you know, I like to preach down here from the floor. I like to be out amongst the people and with the people. That's a beautiful pulpit, John. That it's your dad, you made that? Your dad made that? So, but anyway, I'm going to teach from down here if you guys can, if that's all right with you. Is that cool? Yeah? Now listen, people. Black preachers, we like some feedback. You know what I mean? You got to get ready to say something. You know what I'm saying? You got to be ready to say something, do something. You know, give me a little something. If you're old school, you can, amen. You know, however you, if you're like young, you know, you can give me a word or what's up. I don't care, but say something. Amen? Word? Word, all right, so it's always fun to hear people say, like, let me just hear you say, say word. Maybe give a little word. Wait, let me see everybody do that. Word. That's, like, always funny to see white people doing that. I'm not going to lie to you. It's like, it is like, I'm just here. I love white people. I love you guys. I got a white wife, you know, and stand up so people can see, you know, I got a white wife, you know. See, I... I'm married into my material, you know what I mean? So I can make white people jokes because I'm, no, I'm just teasing. So. But I, I need to be good because my mother-in-law and father-in-law, Everett, Barry, they're here today. She's always like, I can't believe he just said that. But so, so anyway, but it's good to have you all here. And we have a couple of our boys in here. Three of them went out. And um, Trey and Michael are here. Trey and Mi I know, Michael, you want to do what you do. He, uh, uh, Michael Bryant. <laughs> <laughs> he loves it when I introduce him. He loves to stand up and smile and say hi to people and stuff. And so it's good to have you all here. But um, I just, you know, it's been neat. And, and I, I also have a couple of buddies that are here with me. My cousin Guy grew up with that guy. I need to be good today. My cousin Guy is here. And then a couple of buddies I went to junior, grade school, junior high with. David Lester, Ryan Craddock, they're here waving to people. So, I, you know, I was thinking about this before I came up. I'm like, I need to be good because every bad thing I did in my life, one of those three were probably there to see it. So <laughs> they're going to fact check everything I say. Guy, my cousin Guy, man, he's been around through a lot of that stuff. He's like, hey, you ain't nothing special to me. I know what you did. You know, so, hey, there's grace. God, there's grace. God's grace. So. But anyway, you know, we are in town here for the 25th year class reunion at Macomb High School. Graduated in 1990. I was saying to a few people in a couple of my classmates we were saying, you know, when we were in high school going to the parade and, you know, we saw people that were out 25 years and we were like, man, those people are old. Like, you know, like, what's going on with them old people, you know? And now I'm like, well, that's surely not me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, we're young, you know? So, I mean, it's like, what's the deal with that? And so it seems like, you know, the, the, the older you get, the younger people get, you know, and stuff. So, and John, you're saying 50 you're still 20 years older than me, so, I mean, I'm just saying, if I'm, I thought you were 20 years. <laughs> oh, my bad. But I really look at it like this, and I was, I was thinking about what we wanted to share um, in our adult life. I don't know, if you're getting, you know, you're 18, 20, when you're getting to be a, considered an adult, if you will, eight, let's just say 18, and let's just say you work for 50 years before you retire at 65, 68. We're kind of at that halfway point. You know, and I was just thinking about, as I was preparing this over the last couple of weeks, some of the things that I used to think when I was younger that I don't really think about anymore. You know, I mean, I, I remember when I was, like, graduating from high school and even graduating from college, I, I kind of had this mindset, this mentality that, hey, I got to work hard and, and gather as much as I can and, and, you know, have all that I can because he who dies with the most toys wins. I mean, that's what you know, sometimes we believe and, you know, you know, I believe that, you know, I wanted to be successful. I remember thinking that if I can just get a job that, you know, that maybe pays me 18500 and and with some benefits and maybe have a business card, then I have arrived. You know, that's really what I kind of thought, you know, back then. Now it's like 18000 is like, what? I can't afford anything on that, you know. But you just think about some of the, the things that you, you thought in life 25 years ago, and some of you may be you know, more distant than others, and some of you are just a couple years ago. But it's like those things that we thought we knew, we kind of don't really know, do we? I mean, and life just seems to, to take a different 
turn for us, and, and it really it's a maturity process. It's a, it's a growing process. We, we, you know, we maybe you know, come grow a little spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally, I don't know, but some of those things that we thought were the case necessarily aren't right now. And as I, you know, you know, come up to my 25-year, you know, reunion of high school, you know, I realize some of the things I've learned in life, some of my life lessons, and, you know, things like life is about choices and consequences. You know, I mean, literally, um, you, you reap what you sow is what the Bible tells us. And I love Deuteronomy chapter 30. I preach out that many times, you know, that God gives us, he calls us to make a choice. You know, he says, choose this day, and, it, and the choices that you make are going to determine the consequences that you receive in life. You know, I've learned over the years, and I try to teach this to my kids, do things right the first time, or you're going to have to do them over. You know, do things right with, do things with excellence. I tell my boys all the time, it's like, hey, did you close the, hey, come on back here. You know, and usually, there's one that I call more often than others, and I'm not going to say Michael's name. He looked his head down, but... <laughs> Michael is like me. He's most like me. He'll walk into a, a room like, hey, what's up, Dad? Hey, how you doing? I need some food, Mom. What's up? What's going on? And we're like, Michael, the door? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Michael, your muddy shoes? Oh, yeah, I forgot. You know, it's like he just forget. And it's like, Michael, do things right the first time or you're going to have to do them over. You know, and I'm learning that, you know, in life, you know. And um, I, I think another thing that I'm learning is I used to think that, man, leadership. And when I got out of college, I went right into working in the business world, and I had a few people working for me, and I thought, you know what, leadership is me being out front, these people doing what I tell them to do, and me just being nice to them, you know, but as, as I've gone along in life, and as I study, you know, the Bible, I really see that, that true leadership is really servanthood, it's about me serving as many people as I can, I think the, the good um, preacher and motivational speaker Zig Ziglar said it best when he said, help enough people get what they want, and eventually you'll get what you want. You know, but I just think about some of these life lessons that I learned about the grace of God. You know, I learned that, you know, when my grandmother, Kat, went home to be with the Lord. She's the lady that raised me until I was about eight years old, and she lived a hard life for about 72 years, wasn't a believer, didn't know the Lord. And, uh, man, she cursed like a sailor, smoked a pack of cools every day, and drank a, about a six-pack of Bud every day that I can remember that I was alive. And, Man, she got diagnosed with lung cancer, as always happens when people are smoking like that. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And I remember when that happened, I went down to Florida to, to just be with her and meet with her. I had just gone into full-time ministry, and I just wanted to share God's love with her one time. And I remember she saying to me, no, nah, baby, I've done too much. God doesn't want me. And it wasn't a week before she passed that another pastor from one of my cousin's churches went in and prayed with her to accept the Lord. And she accepted him into her heart before she passed on. You talk about 11th hour, you know, and I know that we'll see her in, in heaven one day. Man, lived that whole life, bitterness, anger, just sinning, and, and yet God's grace was big enough to cover my grandmother, Kat, and I'm certain that I'll see her in heaven one day. But, you know, I just think about what we thought before and how it's different when we get a little bit older. And like I said, I feel like I'm at the halfway point of my adult life. And, and, and you know, we just see and, and come to realize that things aren't what we always think that they should be. You know, the Bible tells us that there's, there's a way that seems right to man. You know, but in the end, it leads to death and destruction. And, and you know, we, we have to learn not to see things our way, but to see things the way God sees them. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Matthew chapter 7. I want to give you a p familiar parable here. It's the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 7, or chapter 20, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 20, parable of the sower. I just want to read this to you and just share a few thoughts with you from this parable. It says this, and I'm going to read from the NIV, Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them out into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day 
long doing nothing. Verse 7, because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call all the workers and pay their, them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who came, or so when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have been who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Am I not being unfair to you, friend? Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? Verse 16, So the last will be first, and the first will be last. And this parable, I mean, this is one that I'm sure that you may have heard a time or two in your life, especially if you've been around church for a while. We've heard this story. Many of us have used this to, as an object lesson for our kids. How come they get three pieces of candy? Uh, that ain't fair. I was, I could, hey, don't I, can I do what I want to do? I mean, you know, and you know, I know I've used that parable, you know, that, that example before with my kids, but as we're studying this and just looking to it, there's, there's about five questions that I want to point out to us from this parable that I think we can, we can gain from this. And just five little questions that I want us to look into and dive into. And the first one is this. Who's the person hiring them? Who hires these workers in the vineyard? Well, I think we all know and we see here it says it's a parable about the kingdom of heaven, the, the owner of the vineyard. That represents God. He's the one who hires us to do work. In verses 1 through 7, we see here it shows the agreement that God makes with his workers. With each of us, God's making agreement with us. When he places breath into your lungs, when he gives you life, he's making an agreement with you. And see, it's God's world, and we have to realize that he's the owner, he's the ruler, it's about him, it's not about us. I think that too many of us learn that too late in life. You know, I, I know when I was coming out of high school 25 years ago, I didn't think that. And, and I grew up in church my whole life. I grew up, you know, in Mount Calvary Church of God in Christ. And, and, and knowing that it's about God memorizing books of the Bible and scriptures and, and hearing the gospel message preached. But, but somehow I just really kind of thought that God, it was, he, he made me because I'm special. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I do think that each one of us are, to an extent, special. The Bible tells us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God crafts us out, and he has a plan for each and every one of us. But somehow, we sometimes think that that plan that he has is really all about us. It's to, to give us nice things and to, and to help us to have a great life and, and to be blessed all the time and so that we can, you know, do the things that we want and then end up receiving the reward that he has. And, and really, truly, we have to remember this is God's world. It's his vineyard. And we are just laborers who are hired to work for him. If you're born, you got to remember this. God has a plan for your life. I believe that. If you're born, God has a plan for your life. That plan revolves around bringing glory to him. You remember the story in John chapter 17 when Jesus says, Father, I'm about to die. Glorify me so that I may glorify you. I mean, Jesus, who was the son of God, who was fully God and, and took the, on the form of being fully man, he knew that he came to this earth to live those 33 years. And think about this. Father, the time has now come for you to glorify me. That's kind of ironic because didn't God glorify Jesus in all the other things that he had done? And all the miracles that he performed, wasn't that God bringing glory to him? See, what Jesus was saying is, there comes a time in everybody's life where you will have the opportunity to do what God has created you to do. And for him, he's saying, Father, now's the time where all the light of eternity is going to be shined upon me. Glorify me. Give me the strength, the ability to do what our plan was in heaven, what you created and called me to do, which was come to this earth, live a sinless life, 
and then go to the cross as the perfect sacrifice to die for people's sins. That's what Jesus' purpose was. What's your purpose? See, it's all about realizing what God has called each of us to do, realizing that he's the one who has hired us, and we are just hirelings. We are just vineyard workers. It's about God. It's not about us. Amen? We got to realize that. Second thing I look to see, second question that I ask from this parable is, where are they hired from? Man, the Bible says here in this parable, in verse 6, it says, about 5 in the afternoon, he went out and found still others just standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? So where have you been hired from? These people were hired from the marketplace just standing around doing nothing. Too many people are doing nothing with their life. You know, I, I'm in ministry. I see this all the time. I work in the inner city. I work at Joyce Meyer Ministry. I, I, I'm the you know, director of the St. Louis Dream Center. And every day we have about 800 people that come to our, our ministry, that come to our facilities who need something. And Jesus said, hey, the poor you're always going to have with you. I, you know, I don't, I don't begrudge anybody for being poor. I know what it's like to be poor. You know, I mean, God, you know, I mean, we grew up in the projects. I know what it's like to be on free lunch at school, to eat the government cheese that makes the good, you know, um, you know, grilled cheese sandwiches, you know, those big old thick blocks, you know, and John, you know what I'm talking about too, brother. <laughs> you know, the kind that you get in the big old block that you got to cut, like with that big old knife, you like put your knee on it, you're trying to cut it, you're like, <laughs> that thing's so thick, but if you can get it cut, man, you can get you a good grilled cheese sandwich, you know what I'm saying? I know what it's like to be poor. You know, I was telling, uh, I was telling my, uh, the church, the Dream Center, you know, too? yeah, I hear you, girlfriend. I was telling, I, you know, many of you probably remember me working at McDonald's here, man. Like these young kids, you know, me and guy was working there. And the polyester, I sported the polyester at Macomb on Jackson Street. And, hey, you know, there ain't nothing glamorous about that, flipping burgers, you know what I mean? And so I, I, I know, you know, and, and so I know what it's like, and I don't begrudge anyone for that, but I tell people all the time, you know, just because you're here right now, just because you're in this circumstance, in this situation, doesn't mean you have to stay there. But see, what happens is so many people, because of their circumstance in life, whether it's their, their economic status, maybe it's their relationship status, people that are, don't have someone, that thought they would have someone, and they're just, you know, they're just lonely, and that loneliness turns into depression, and the depression just stifles them, or or, or, you know, maybe it, maybe it goes back to, you know, their health issues. You know, maybe, maybe there is something, you know, that, that has been afflicting you, or maybe a disease or, or an ache or a pain that you're living with, and it starts to affect the way you feel, and then it starts to affect your mind, and, 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 you, and you just get, you found that you're in a situation where it's just hard for you to want to wake up and to be joyful, you know, and to, be, to rejoice always like the Bible tells us. And, and the enemy... He's just oppressing you, and he's got you in one of those states. And, and you know, what's happening now as a result is about your life. You go, I know God has a plan for me, but my situations are such that and you're, just, you're just surviving in life. I think too many people are just surviving in life. Too many people are just getting by in life. I know what that's like. I know it, and I see it. And, and you know, and the thing is, is this is, you know, too many people are just standing around, sitting around, being in their life, and they're doing nothing. And they're just waiting to die. And then they hope that when they die, that they maybe have done enough good instead of bad, so that when they see Jesus, well, hopefully he'll say, enter in. And that's not the way the Bible tells us it has to be. Because by faith, we know that if we are doing the things that God asks us to do after we've received them in our heart, we can be guaranteed of our eternal reward. And so we are trying to send as much blessing ahead into the kingdom of heaven. You know, because, you know, we're working here with our finances, with our time, with our resources. You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead of you. And so a lot of us who, who realize and understand it's not about me trying to gather this stuff here on this earth, but it's about doing these things so that when I stand before Jesus and he says, well done, come into your reward, that you're going to be blessed for what you've done for him. But I just think that too many of us are just sitting around doing nothing. And it's sad because 
you know, the world is getting smaller with the invent of Facebook. And, and I see people all the time, I talk to them all the time that are just like, oh, man, I'm just same old, same old. People are just, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of where I never thought I would be. And by this time, I thought I'd be a little bit further down the road uh, economically or relationally or spiritually, socially. I just, I'm, I'm kind of not where I thought I'd be. And as I, as I think about some of, you know, the people that have graduated around the time that I have, man, there's a lot of them that are doing well, a lot of them that are blessed, but there's a lot of people that are just, man, I'm just kind of not where I thought I would be. Where are they hired from? Too many people are hired from just doing nothing. They're doing it their own way. And if that's you in here this morning, I'd say this. Why not try to do it God's way? <laughs> You've been trying it long enough your own way. You've been doing what the world says do, but man, you find that you just, it's like you're one of them little gerbils in that little bitty gerbil ball. You're just trying to go as much as you can, but then you stop and you're just like, I'm, I'm getting nowhere. You know, and, and I'm not any happier. I'm not any better off than I've been. And, you know, but I've been trying to keep up with the Joneses and live the American dream. Why not try it God's way? Why not pick up his word, start to read it, start to learn it, to find out what he asks of you and what he expects from you, to see what he promises to you so that he can bless you with what he promises. See, because this word is full of the covenant promises of God. If you do this, then he will do this. See, we often think that, that God's blessings are like salvation. See, salvation comes to anyone. You don't have to do anything for salvation. All you have to do is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and you're saved. But do you realize that there's so many promises in the Bible that come from a covenant? If you do this, then he will do this. And we have to know these things. Why not try it God's way? So where are, you, where are they hired from? Too many people are hired from doing nothing. That's what I see, and that just saddens my heart. Third question that I see from this parable is this. What are they hired to do? That's a question I ask. What are these people hired to do? See, these people in this parable, they were hired to go work in his vineyard, to go work in the vineyard. And when I think about working in the vineyard, I think of um, the work that we have to do as a part of the church. And when I say as a part of the church, let's first talk about the church with the capital C. That's part of the body of Christ church. doesn't matter if you belong to industry, Assembly of God, if you belong to the St. Louis Dream Center, if you belong to a different church. We are all, as Christians, we are all part of the church with the capital C, the body of Christ. And we're supposed to plant the seed, water the seed, harvest the seed. We're supposed to go out and scatter the seed. You know the parable of the sower. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man went out and he scattered the seed. And that's what we are all called to do. We were given a great commission, and it says to go into all the world and tell them about Jesus, to make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them everything that's in my word, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. That's what we're called to do. That's the work that we're supposed to do as part of working in the vineyard. We're hired to bring people into the body of Christ. But I want to talk about this because I also think that we're all called to work in the vineyard, the little C. That's the, that's the body that you belong to. That's the church body that you profess to be your home. There's work that you need to do. You know, I tell people all the time, we have an eat, serve philosophy at the St. Louis Dream Center. Eat, serve is what we tell you. It's my job as the pastor and my pastoral team, whether it's me, Pastor Tony sharing the word today, he's my assistant pastor. It's our job to, to study the word to share a message so that the, when the people come in, they know that they're going to get fed themselves, but they also know that if they bring a guest or a friend, that person's going to have the opportunity to hear the gospel and give the opportunity to respond accordingly. That's what our job is, to make sure that you're eating, and it's your job to eat what you need, to get fed spiritually. Now, I believe this. If you're a mature Christian, you need to learn to feed yourself on a daily basis at home. You know, Because too many times we're expecting to come to the buffet well, man, church wasn't good today. Pastor John wasn't on his game. Well, you realize that it's not his job to make sure you get fed, fed spiritually if you're a mature believer. It's your job. You have a Bible. How many of us have Bibles? And how many of you have time? So, you know, use that, you know. Read the Bible, study, and pray. And so 
especially us mature Christians. And I know some of you, some of you were in Macomb Assembly when I was there. I know some of y'all are mature Christians, and I see you working, so this isn't a condemnation on anybody, and John doesn't ask me to say this, but as a pastor who has a pastor's heart, it's your job to work in the little seeds. Everybody in here should be eating and serving. That's the expectation at the St. Louis Dream Center. There's something that you can do. There's something that everybody can do. I look at Walmart, man. They hire people in wheelchairs to come and greet. If you're in a wheelchair, you can stand at the door and greet somebody. Maybe you can come and hammer. Hey, maybe you want me to sign up to hammer some nails. Did you see who won the nail hammering contest at the Heritage Days last night? Don't make me take off this jacket and flex a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, what's up? Weren't you in that too? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> My wife was like, they did that last night. Our family went to the Heritage Days, and they had all those little contests, and I I entered the pie eating contest. I know you probably thought I would win that one, but that's not the one that I won, okay? So, but they did, they had the nail hammering contest and, and I went up there and I told them, I was like, hey, I'm gonna win this thing. This brother man's gonna bring it home. Went up there, pop out, pop out, hammering in those five nails, boom. Oh, oh, you know, so, and <laughs> after my wife was like, baby. Yeah, that's a good thing, you know what I'm saying? That's all I'm gonna say, because my sons are here. But so, um. <laughs> but you know, we are, <laughs> but there's something that we all can do, and I encourage you, find out what you can do in your church, you know, and, and here's the thing too, and you know, find out what is being done, and just get involved and be faithful there. You know, I always love it when, when church members, because you know, whenever there's a message preached like this, everybody wants to come to me with their ideas. Okay, well, you know what, I want to get involved. Here's what I want to do, I want to start this ministry. You know what, no, just do, find out what's being done right now, and be faithful and serve there. And then after a little time, then, after you're showing yourself faithful, then maybe present your idea. But there's so much work to be done. Man, I just want to encourage you all in the industry. This is a beautiful, beautiful church. Your church is doing some things. It's being talked about. Capitalize on that. There's so many people in this area who need to know Jesus. Bring them. Bring them to church. You know, and, and see them get saved because we're all supposed to be working in the vineyard. Amen? Because the day is going to come where no man can work, right? So let's work while the day is still light. But, you know, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So, you know, we're, we, what are they hired to do? First is work in God's vineyard. Secondly, you know, we're called to, uh, upon to be workers. I mean, you know, we're supposed to, you know, the church, the big C, but we're all supposed, also supposed to be doing God's work of evangelizing people. Man, this is going out and spreading the gospel. I love what Rick Warren says in his book, Purpose Driven Life. And he, he says in there, I mean, you are created for two reasons. Number one, to have a relationship with God, and number two, to help as many people as possible find that same relationship. That's what we're created to do, to work in the vineyard. So work for God, man, and, and I'll say this, working for God's not for sissies. I, I, there's, this, there's this saying, it says, a man may go idle to hell, but if he's go to heaven, he must be busy. You know, a lot of people don't like to hear that. You know, once you receive God, you don't have to do anything to receive salvation that's free, and that's easy. But discipleship, the process of becoming like Jesus, that's going to cost you something. And it's hard work, and it's not for sissies. We're all called to work in the vineyard until we see Jesus. Amen? Amen. Remember, guys, I'm a brother, man. I need some feedback in here. Y'all can say something. Word, yeah. Fourth question I pose when I look at this passage is this. Number four, I look at, you know, what will their wages be? What are they getting paid? I like to know what I'm going to get paid. You know, I worked at McDonald's for three thirty-five an hour. I wish they had fifteen-dollar minimum wage back then. You know, but no. Their pay, we see in Scripture, it was one denarius in this parable, and this was considered a good wage. You know, when he said, "Hey, if you come and work for me, work in my vineyard, I'm going to pay you a denarius." And see, interesting enough, this would be the pay that a Roman soldier would receive for their day's work. So this is a good pay. I mean, this isn't something that you're paying poor people. One denarius is what the Roman soldiers would get paid. And that was considered one of the best jobs that you could have at the time. So it's a very fair and even generous pay that he is willing to pay them. And, and I see this in verse 3. It says even this. He says, when he went out again, and he's offering people that, he says, so they went, he went out again about noon and about 3 in the afternoon and did the same thing. And, and it says even, oh, wait, that was verse 5. It says in verse 3 here, it says, um, 
About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he told them, I'm going to pay you what's right. Now, you know what? I've been around a lot of people, and I'm going to tell you this. If I know that someone is generous and someone is kind, I'd rather they not tell me what they're going to pay me. I want them to just pay me what's right. I've been around generous people, and I mean, I played football in, you know, college, and I can remember times when, you know, and, and Ryan, you played too, you know, you, when you're a college at football athlete, you, you can only make about, at the time, we can only make $2,500 for a year. And so that's all you can make. You know, you try to do that over summertime, but, you know, the scholarship regulations, it regulates you, and, and so you can't make money. And, and I remember times when I would, during the season or whatever, I'd have somebody say, hey, I want you to come over and help me do something and maybe move a piano. And they're like, how much you charge? I'm like, you know what, you just pay me whatever you feel like it's worth. Because I knew if I was going to work for somebody generous, they are going to pay me more than what I charged them. They are going to give me one of them, you know, them Pentecostal handshakes. Here's 100, you know. Praise the Lord, you know what I mean? That's, you know, I would rather someone pay me, if they're a kind and generous person, just pay me what you feel is right. I remember when we were in college, we would do car washes, and, and I remember saying to people, I was like, hey, listen, I was like the president of our association, I said, listen, we're not going to charge anybody. We're just going to tell them what our cause is, and we're going to tell them, you give us a donation. We would always have people, you know, pay us 20s and 30s and 50s here versus the $5 that we would normally think to charge. If you find someone who is generous, I would much rather them pay me what they feel is right and fair. And the same is true with God. He's a generous God, and he does things, and he's going to give you what is fair. And so you need to understand he's always going to give you more than you deserve. Because let's be real. And, hey, some of my buddies I grew up with, if we got what we deserved, it'd be over. I mean, and some of you can say the same thing. If you got what you deserved, you'd be in the grave, you'd be dead, you'd spend eternity away from him. So what are your wages? Man, God isn't going to owe you anything because he's generous and he's fair. And he knows what you need and he knows what's best for you. The question is this, do you trust him? Do you trust him enough to say, God, do what you feel is right and fair and best for me? See, that's the best place to be. And, and God is just, he's taught, he's been teaching me this lesson as I continue to go. See, that's where faith comes in, too. Because a lot of, I'm, I'm, I'm just very much, you know, an objective person. I like to know, okay, you know, and my wife will tell you, I like to know, let's have this thing planned out. Let's get it going. And so it's hard for me sometimes to go into that realm of faith because I want to know that A and B equals C. You know, but sometimes with God, A and B equals F and G and Q and Z. I mean, he, and, and that's where faith comes in. And it's this walk of faith. And I've heard it said from somebody, the only two ways to please God is through faith and obedience. That's what he blesses, faith and obedience. And so, man, we need to realize and understand that God is going to pay us what's, what's, what, he, what he thinks is right and what he thinks is fair, not what we think we deserve. So just go on that journey and trust him a little bit. The fifth question I got on this is, you know, it says here, and we're looking at this passage here, what are the terms of their hiring agreement? What are the terms? Well, the terms are this. He wanted them to work for a day. It's but a day's work that is to be done. Everybody, he's going out to charge to have them work a day. And now you know this. If you've been in life, you know that this day, this day's work, it represents our life that we have to live. You know, unfortunately, there's some people whose day is a little bit shorter. And this past week, Angie and I, we, we found out news that um, one of our um, one of our um, people that, that's in our ministry in Florida, and their family, right before we went to Florida about um, 10 years ago, they had lost their two or three-year-old. I think the baby was two years old in, in a pool accident. And, and, um, it was just tough on them, and the family rebounded from that and through God's grace. And, and I think about that little two-year-old that we never had a chance to know, but would have been about Michael's age now. And, and um, man, we just found out this past week that um, on Tuesday, they lost their teenage daughter who was in our ministry, who was in our college ministry. She died in a car accident. And you just think, man, that's just a tough, tough load for any family to have to bear. But then I think about this. These were believers. These were Christian people. And, and the day after their daughter died, 
the mom is, is posting a devotion. Yeah, I'll worship the Lord even in the midst of that. They understand that a day, <laughs> man, a day, hey, we're not promised any amount of time in life. None of us are. Whether it's two years, whether it's the 22 years with your daughter, where, whether it's your 60 years or my 43 years or Pastor John's 94 years. I don't know. I mean, you know, I thought that's how it was with my dad. <laughs> But, you know, a day is the time that we get to live in this life. And, and the time of life is the day in which we must work the works that he, that God has sent us to do. And you only have one life to live and you only have one day to live. it. It's the day that the Lord has given you. And whether those days are one year, 100 years, or anything in between. And see, a day is a short time for life, but the reward is for eternity. The work is only a day, but the reward is for eternity. God's calling us to work this day. And we have to realize the sense of urgency and the diligence that's needed to work for this short day. I just think about all that's going on in the world, and I just think about um, and just you know how, how brief life is. And, and, you know, especially at my halfway point, just thinking about, and then, you know, what if, 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 I'm like at the average person. I might have another 25 years, and I think about my kids and what am I teaching them. Not, not about all the stuff that we have. Do we have the nicest car? Do we have a big enough house? Have we been able to take the best vacation? I don't think about that stuff. I think about am I teaching my boys what it's like to live being a man, and not just a man but a man of God. Am I teaching my daughter, you know, how to value herself and how, how to, to be, you know, a young lady who lives for the Lord, who's strong and kind, yet who is able um, to be, to be um, susceptible enough to find someone that, that she can partner with, who can do life with. And I just think about this. He's not bothering me, man. Let him do his thing. And I was in youth ministry forever, man. He's going to get tired sooner or later. All right, so, but I just think about this. I think about, you know, if, you, if I, it ain't bothering me if he ain't bothering you. Are y'all with me? You're like, what's he going to do? <laughs> and I got five kids in my house. This is just, this is what I call afternoon. You know what I mean? So <laughs> we're at grandma's house now. And Mary, you're not used to that, are you? She's like, oh, man, they're just, hey, that's a, this is good right here. You know? But I think about the time that we have to live and, and all of us, each of us, every single one of us, you know, we, we just have that day that we have to live for the Lord. And we have to realize the sense of urgency in which we must live. You never know when your time's going to be up. We were talking, a couple of us were talking yesterday at the, the parade about some of our classmates. And just, again, halfway point, we're, we're trying to be we're being a little bit reflective, and we're thinking about, man, is, is there any of our class that, that are not here? You know, we're thinking about people that we know around our time that, that have just passed away. And, you know, one of the guys we used to hang with, we're, we're talking about Corey, how, died in an accident, you know, car accident a couple years ago. You just never know when your time's going to be up. You know, but, but and, and that's why we as believers, one, workers in the field, we have to understand the sense of urgency in which we must work. And that we, you know, we, but we have only a little time to work because the night is coming when no man can work. That's what it says in John chapter 9, verse 4. And sadly, if our great work that God has called us to do is left undone. When our day is done, it'll be undone forever. People that God's called you to reach, if you're not working while the day is still light, they may never be reached. Your neighbor who God's just, there's the Holy Spirit's been telling you, just go over and talk to him. Bake him some cookies and just go talk to him. You don't have to always go and preach. You don't have to be a Bible expert. You don't have to have gone to Bible college, man, to just go and show love to someone. Maybe just some cookies and an invitation to come to church. Maybe just a ride to pick up some kids to go to vacation Bible school to bring their family to church. You know how my mom ended up being a Christian? Many of you guys know my mom, Barb Houston. You know what? You know how she ended up? How I many of you guys know my mom? She's a woman of God, isn't she? You know how she got saved? Because her son, me, was going to church. She was drinking, smoking, doing her thing. But she knew enough to make me go to church. I'd walk to church, Mount Calvary Church of God in Christ. And, and I was doing in the church thing and, and would, you know, do the testimony service and, and sing. And I was learning. The, the elders of the church were teaching me stuff. And they start telling her, Barb, you got to come and hear your son. And she came one day. She was high and she was drunk when she came into church. She came in. She got saved, sanctified, 
filled with the Holy Spirit, and you know that she is a woman of God nowadays, and you never know how, what it's going to take to bring somebody, you know, to the Lord. Maybe just going and, and inviting the kids to come to vacation Bible school and offering to pick them up, and, and then you'll always get a kid to come to church if you tell them you'll buy them a McDonald's ice cream cone afterwards. You know what I'm saying? Is that true? A hundred out of a hundred kids will come to church if you promise them an ice cream cone. You know what I'm saying? So, and so, you know, we have to work, man, you know, and that's what it means. But, but this great work that we have to do, it has to be done while the day is still light. But I'll say this on the flip side as well. We should also be encouraged in reference to the hardships and difficulties of our lives. It's only a short time. Maybe you're in a tough situation. Maybe you're in a tough relationship. You're a believer, you're a Christian, and you're going, man, it could be better if I didn't have to endure this. But isn't it worth hanging on for that one day? Isn't it worth enduring and, and pressing through and, and being faithful for the day that God's called you to live? Because you know what? If you were to look at your life on the, on the blip of eternity, you could put a dot, and then you just draw a line for the rest of eternity. Isn't it worth enduring the hardships? Maybe you're struggling financially and the enemy's starting to tell you, do something illegal, and you know that that's not the right thing to do. The enemy's starting to tell you, don't pay your tithes, don't give, and you know that's not the right thing to do because you have to think about eternity. You're already a believer. You're working. There's going to be hardships. There's going to be bumps and bruises upon the way, but endure. Hang in there. Press through for this one day. You're lonely. God knows your loneliness. Maybe you're in here today and you're your spouse has gone on to be with the Lord, and, and you're just literally just waiting to see Jesus. God's saying to you, listen, I know your pain, but you can still be faithful for this one day and have the joy of the Lord that's your strength and get in there and serve until you see him because it's just a day. And we have to make sure on the flip side of this, man, endure, hang on, persevere, trust God for the remainder of this day. We have to make sure that, that we're holding out, that we're having faith, that we're being patient yet a little bit longer. Don't make the mistake the first workers made by looking at uh, what others received. Well, God, it ain't fair. How come I've been working faithfully, but they, they, we, I've been a Christian longer than them. How come they receive all the blessing? That ain't fair. You know what? You have your one day. Just endure. Do your job. Work the way you're supposed to work. God, how come you know, that new person can be up on the stage and, and doing, doing work? That ain't fair. What's going on with it? Don't look at what other people are doing. You focus on the promises that God has given you for the day that you're living. Focus on what he has done for you and be thankful for his grace to you. And this parable is one that speaks to God's divine grace and his unending generosity. He didn't have to pay the ones that came in later in the evening the same wage that he paid the ones that came in earlier. But what God is saying to us and through this, and, and we just see that this parable, it starts with this, the, this is like the kingdom of heaven. No matter where you enter in on the journey, whether you, you were born into a Christian home and you've lived a Christian life all your life, that's my kids' testimony. They've been they were born to Christian. They've been in church all the time. I mean, that's their testimony. Some of us, man, Maybe you, you didn't grow up in church. You got saved as a youth, or maybe you got saved as an adult. Maybe you just got saved. Maybe you don't even know the Lord right now. Wherever you come in on this journey, man, the biggest thing is the kingdom of heaven is like this. God's going to give you the same reward for your faithfulness. I just think about that. And, you know, it's a matter of this, man. We're all working. We're all working to receive this eternal life. And, you know, we have one life to work, live. You have one day to live it. And, you know, God is saying to you that no matter when or where or how you come to know him, just come to know him and start working for him. Go out and work in that vineyard. And for those of us that do know him, hang on, be faithful, remain steadfast to the end. Angie and I were thinking about this on our way over here this morning. And, and you know, John and Robbie, man, we have known them for a while. And they've meant so much to us in our life. They, I mean, you all have been faithful, and we're talking about your kids, and, and it's cool to see we were over there at Heritage Day seeing Elijah get up there and do his worship, and Sarah, and, and you know, all of them, man, just that what they're doing in the family, how they're just faithful and they're hard workers, and, and you know, we're just thinking about 
and the work that they're doing. And you guys are blessed with your pastor and his family. I mean, and I'm um, just blessed. And so, and, and not only the work that you're doing here, but just what they're doing for so many people man, around the world, the missions work, and people that you launch in the ministry, myself and Angie and just so many others. And, um, man, it's going to be so neat for you guys when you get to heaven and to hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, but I just want to encourage you, you know, keep doing it. And I see this building that you're here, and I get your, I'm on the, the industry mailing list, and I see, you know, all this going on. I know what's happening. And I see all the work that you all are doing. And, and I just want to encourage you, keep doing it because your day is now. And there's people, it's not just about building a bigger building, a nicer building, having more. It's about having more room for the harvest that God wants to bring in. Because there's too many people that are dying that are going to spend eternity in hell unless we, the workers in the vineyard, are working for them. You know, and so I just want to encourage you, keep doing your work. And, you know, um, I, I want to sing a song, and it's, you know, for you all, John and Robbie and, and your whole family. And, you know, you can get this ready up there, but... Um, and it's just a, a simple song that, that I love. It's ministered to me many times as we're working in the field. Sometimes it seems like we get a little bit tired, we get a little bit worn out. But, man, John, God is, God's is god got you. He's going to take care of you. He's for you. And um, just keep on going. And um, I just want to encourage you all because you all have work to do. So let me sing this song, and, you know, we'll see. You go ahead and play it when you get it ready. So constant, so loving and so true, so powerful in all you do. You fill me, you see me, you know my every move, you love for me to sing to you. I know that you are for me. I know that you are for me. I know that you will never forsake me in my weakness. And I know that you have come now, even if to ride upon my heart to remind who you are. Oh, 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 oh. So patient, so gracious, be so merciful and true, so wonderful. Forsake me in my weakness, and I know that you have come now, even if to ride upon my heart to remind me. And I know that you are for me, I know you are for me, I know that you will never. Forsake me in my weakness, and I know that you have come now, even if to ride upon my heart to remind me. You 
are Jesus. I know that you are for me. Yes. Oh. And then, John, remember. I know that He is for you. I know that He is for you. I know that He will never forsake you in your weakness. And I know that He has come down, even if to ride upon all of our hearts to remind you. Just close your eyes and bow your heads. I just want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much. I thank you that you've called us to be workers in the vineyard. I thank you that you've given us a, a wonderful pay, Lord. That the reward is definitely worth it, Lord. I thank you that even in the midst of our work, that you're never going to leave us. You'll never forsake us. You'll give us your strength, Lord thank you that you're fair and generous in the terms that you set out. I pray that you just strengthen us to work, to do all the work that you've called us to do, Lord. And strengthen industry, strengthen this church, strengthen this ministry, the leaders, all the pastors, all the elders, all the members, Lord, to do the work that you've called them to do. God, I pray for people in this room this morning that's here, Lord, that would say, they don't know you, that they don't have a relationship with you, Lord, I pray that you're talking to them right now. Begin to speak to their heart. God, let them know that you have a plan for their life. And God, they've been doing it their way for so long. That there's another way, Lord, and all they have to do is yield to you. I pray that today is the day of salvation. And maybe you're in here this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed just for another moment. You say, man, God is speaking to me right now, Pastor. He's talking to my heart. And I don't know where you came from or what you've been through. I think about my years of life as you know, a couple of our buddies were talking about where God brought us from, me and Dave and Ryan, and, and how God knew us, man, even before we were born. And, and he had a plan for our life. And his plan is to prosper us and to not hurt us tell you this, if you're here today and you don't know the Lord, maybe you've never asked for forgiveness for your sins, maybe you've done it before but you're not where you need to be, God has a plan for your life. He is for you. Maybe you just want to say a simple prayer and ask him to forgive you for your sins and come into your heart and live there forever. See, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know your past. I can tell you what your future can be. It can be an abundant life. It can be an eternal life. And, and I'm going to say this, the road's not going to be easy. It's junk that happens to all of us, but it's worth it. So if you're in here this morning and you want to make a decision to ask God to forgive you for your sins, and you want to be born again is what we call it. If that's you, would you just, everybody, just wait. Just, if your head's about right now, your eyes are closed. But if that's you, would you just raise your hand? You can make eye contact with me. You can put it down. I see you. Anybody? Here's the deal. Let's go ahead and stand. I just want to close it out with a prayer for you all. Because maybe you're in here today, and this is my second part of this, and you say, Pastor, I needed this word because I am a Christian. I've been working in the field. I'm just getting tired, and sometimes maybe you get worn out. Maybe you've forgotten why you were working. Got the reward that you're working for a generous and a fair God who's going to take care of you. He's going to hook you up. The Holy Spirit speaking to you in some way. And you say, I needed to hear this. And I just want to offer a prayer for you and give you an opportunity just to respond, to yield to him. Because when God speaks to your heart, what we need to do is, is, is yield to him to say, I accept that, Lord. We accept it into our hearts. We accept it into our minds. And then I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to begin to talk to you about what he wants you to do in your life. Maybe he wants you to make some changes. Maybe he wants you to start doing something. Maybe he wants you to stop doing something. 
And God is for you, and, and he's with you, and he wants you to be strong and healthy to continue working in his vineyard until you see him. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. So if God's speaking to you and that's for you, you're already a believer, but you just need to be encouraged and you want to be a part of this prayer, just lift your hands up to him as, a, as an acceptance for this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for what you're doing in this place, for these wonderful people of Industry Assembly, Lord, and all that are, that are here visiting. Lord, I just thank you for your people, how you bless us, Lord, and God, how you're faithful and just, Lord God, and, and you call us to, to endure and, and how you empower us to do the work that you called us to, Lord pray for every person in here, Lord God, that needs your strength, your power, your passion, maybe your renewed energy, your renewed vigor, Lord God. God, I pray that you give them all that they need to continue doing the work that you call them to do, Lord. God, let them know that you'll never leave them, you'll never forsake them, God, that you're for them, Lord. God, you want them to get out there and do the work in the field, to work while the day is still light, because the day is coming where no man will work, Lord. So God, I pray for them. I pray for this church. Bless them all. Be with them. In Jesus' name I pray.